how would you categorize dead instruments that are convertible into equity or dead instruments whose interests vary with entity's performance or with stock price or perhaps more strikingly how would you see preference shares which pay a certain fixed percentage on their par value at some point we'll have to say that this is not a basic lending arrangement this is not solely payment of principal and interest or who knows at some point a preference share may become an SPPR instrument it's more important to see through these mere labels of debt and equity instruments into what these instruments actually offer in substance. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this video by understanding IFRS 9 cash flow characteristic test. In the previous videos, we discussed the significance of cash flow characteristic test or the SPPI test as some people call it. And it is one of the two fundamental pillars of the classification criteria. If you don't understand this test properly, you can get the entire classification and measurement requirements wrong for any particular financial instrument. Let's jump right into the core principle. To be considered solely payment of principal and interest, the cash flows of instrument should be consistent with a basic lending arrangement. What? A basic lending arrangement. Don't worry, you have all the right to ask what a basic lending arrangement is. So let's look at the interest in a basic lending arrangement. In a basic lending arrangement, the interest is most significantly comprised of so now we're going to discuss what interest should look like in a basic lending arrangement in accordance with IFRS 9. Um, so in a basic lending arrangement the interest is most significantly comprised of consideration for the time value of money which is unmodified we all know that interest is basically due to the time value of money but IFRS 9 adds here that it should be unmodified now what unmodified really means we'll be going into that in the later part of the video also the consideration for credit risk. Now these are the two most significant uh, components of interest in a basic lending arrangement. The time value of money and the consideration for credit risk. But in addition to these, interest can also comprise of other components in a basic lending arrangement. And these components include consideration for other basic lending risk, for example, liquidity risk, consideration for other basic lending costs, for example, administration costs. In addition, interest can include a profit margin that is consistent with the basic lending arrangement. So now we have five components uh, which are acceptable in the light of IFRS 9 within a basic lending arrangement. And these are, let me repeat those, consideration for time value of money, which is unmodified, consideration for credit risk, consideration for other basic lending risk, and consideration for other basic lending costs, for example, administration costs. And finally, a profit margin that is consistent with the basic lending arrangement. In essence, we are saying that if interest is meant to compensate for anything other than these five components, then the cash flows will fail to meet the SPPI test. For example, if a contract stipulates that an interest rate will increase with the stock price of an entity, think about it. This gives the contractual cash flows exposure to stock price fluctuations. Now, exposure to stock price is not a credit risk and not a basic lending risk, and therefore, such a contract is not consistent with basic lending arrangement. Make sense? Similarly, if a loan was granted to back the purchase of a cash generating unit, and if the interest payments are correlated with the cash generated by that unit, it gives the contractual cash flow exposure to the performance of the unit, which is other than a credit risk and other than a basic lending risk. To say it more crudely, it's like a lender saying to the borrower that you can pay me better if a particular asset performs better or pay me less if it doesn't. This is not consistent with the basic lending arrangement. But hold on, before you jump to the conclusion that there are no variations possible within a basic lending arrangement, let me show you what kind of variations are still basic. First and foremost are the variable interest rates which are linked to a benchmark rate like LIBO. A loan that pays an interest at LIBO plus X percent is still consistent with the basic lending arrangement as it provides exposure to no risk other than credit risk or other basic lending risk. Moreover, if the contract stipulates that the interest will increase if the borrower defaults in some payments, it can still be a basic lending arrangement. That is, if the increase in interest corresponds to the increase in counterparty's risk of default. More interestingly, if the cash flows or the interest is linked to, uh, to an inflation index such as a consumer price index, still the cash flows are considered consistent with the basic lending arrangement because it simply means that the interest would remain the same in real terms. 
All the examples we discussed so far help us understand whether the contractual terms exposes the lender to a risk that are other than the basic lending risks. So far we had the risk perspective. But now we'll talk about that time value of money being modified. Modified is what they call it if the interest rate behaves in peculiar ways without necessarily exposing the lender to any additional risks. How can the time value of money be modified? Here are some examples. If original loan has an interest and principal to be paid on predefined dates and yet if the interest is not paid timely, the interest doesn't accrue additional interest. Which means if there's no interest on interest, it, the time value of money component would be considered modified. Now don't get this wrong, there can be a basic lending arrangement where there is no interest at all. What we are saying is if there is an interest on principal but no interest on interest, then the time value of money would be considered modified. Having no interest means having an interest of 0%, which is consistent with the basic lending arrangement. Similarly, if a, if a loan has a inversely floating interest rate, that is the interest rate flows in the opposite direction of the benchmark rate. And finally, time value of money component is modified if the floating interest is an average of multiple periods or if the floating interest rate updates every three months to a six month benchmark. If a floating interest rate resets every three months, it must reset to a three monthly rate, not a six monthly rate or not an average of any amount of rates to be considered unmodified time value of money and if the time value of money is modified then naturally it's not solely payment of principal interest so we looked at the interest from various angles and what it should look like in the basic lending arrangement but have we even defined a principal yet i first nine defines principal as the fair value of a financial asset at initial recognition which may change over the life of the finance instrument for example when there are repayments of principal Right now, what concerns us the most is what would happen if our right to receive principal or interest is impaired due to certain events or conditions. One of such events is bankruptcy. So note that an instrument's contractual cash flows are SPPI only if the following is true in case of a debtor's non-payment. First, non-payment is considered a breach of contract. And secondly, the holder has a contractual right to unpaid amounts of principal and interest in the event of debtor's bankruptcy. If the holder does not have the right over unpaid amounts, then it's not considered solely payments of principal interest. Now you might be wondering, when on earth will the lender not have the right over unpaid amounts? If the creditor's claim is limited to specified assets of the debtor or the cash flows from specified assets, then the creditor may not have the right over all the unpaid amounts. For example, if the creditor's claim is limited to an asset whose value is $5,000 and the unpaid amounts are $7,000, that would naturally mean that the creditor does not have the legal claim on the remaining $2,000, in, in which case this contractual arrangement cannot be considered as PPI. This is called a non-recourse arrangement, but, but just being non-recourse does not make uh, contractual cash flow non SPPI. For such arrangements, the lender must look through to the underlying asset or cash flows in making this determination. Finally, if, the, if a bond is callable, which, is, which means if the borrower has the option to prepay the amounts, in that case, uh, he might be contractually obliged to pay an amount in addition to principal and interest which is called normally as a prepayment penalty. This prepayment penalty is to compensate the holder for early termination. Now the question is, if an instrument has contractually defined prepayment penalty, would that comprise solely payment of principal interest? Because it is, in fact, in addition to solely payment of principal interest. Such prepayment penalty can fall within the SPPI criteria if the following conditions are fulfilled. The entity acquires or originates the financial asset at a premium or discount to the contractual par amount and the prepayment amount substantially represents the contractual par amount and accrued contractual interest which may include reasonable additional compensation for the early termination of the contract and when the entity initially recognizes the financial asset the fair value of the prepayment feature is insignificant. 
I hope this video gave you a very clear perspective when analyzing um, the contractual cash flows and whether they meet the SPPI criteria or not. In the next video, we'll be talking about the de-recognition of financial assets and liabilities.